Dr. Stoll, thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you how excited I am that you are with us. I'm a huge fan of, of yours. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, thanks, Gigi and Cersei. It's really my honor to, to join you. And um, uh, Gigi, I know you better than Cersei, but you've done some amazing things, you know, your book and the programs and working with school lunches. So I really appreciate the way that you are impacting lives and you've taken this lifestyle and you've reached out to begin changing other people's lives and share it like a gift. So it's really my honor to support all that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoll. All right, so we wanted to start off just by um, hearing a little more about your story and then like how you evolved into lifestyle medicine. Yeah, thank you, because you're right. Like most doctors, I did not learn this in medical school. And, uh, you know, I grew up always in a family that health was of interest. And, you know, my dad would ride his exercise bike watching the news and he would say, hey, Scotty, come here and do some push-ups with me and calf raises on the hearth of the fireplace. So there was always a, an idea of health and the pursuit of health, but we just didn't know back then. So I went to medical school and residency. And um, with my athletic background, I thought I understood health. And uh, my wife, I, I have to always share this, in my second year of med school, she said, you know, I really think we should change our diet. And it, back then it was, you know, like a plant-based vegan diet. And I said, where am I gonna get my protein? <laughs> I asked the fateful <laughs> question that I'm stuck answering the rest of my life. Oh. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. And she was, uh, I've learned that now when she comes, I have to listen much sooner because it took me a number of years to finally catch up to her. But I was in practice one day and um, I kept hearing my patients always say to me, I'm falling apart, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? And I always was, I taught, was taught in medical school and residency that these are kind of diseases of aging, you know, bad genes, and maybe our choices contribute like smoking um, and eating too much sugar, but you know, I really didn't have an understanding of the impact of lifestyle. But I, I assumed that my role as a doctor was to slow down the train and try and control the disease that presented in my office. And so I did that by writing prescriptions for medications. I did it by doing injections, by ordering MRIs to clarify the diagnosis, sending people off for different surgeries, chemotherapy. And you know, I assumed like most doctors do, that's that's good medicine. You know, we're doing a good job because the numbers look good and the patient's complaining less. And so I'm doing my job well. Um, there was a day in my practice, a woman was sitting there and she said, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart. And so I just said, what does falling apart actually mean to you? Because I hear it all the time. And so I assume like most doctors, it had to be some problem on her problem list. You know, I have a lot of back pain. I have side effects from medications. That surgery really messed me up. And then she said, and it totally surprised me, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is so tired of taking care of me. Mm -hmm. um, I can't travel to see my grandchildren because of my illnesses. We're facing financial bankruptcy because of the cost of health care. I don't have any friends anymore. I'm depressed. And then she said, with tears rolling down her cheeks, can you help me? And in that moment, you know, as a doctor, you realize like you've got nothing. You know, one of the things you kind of pride yourself on as a doctor is like having a toolbox full of things you can pull out to help people. You know, it's kind of our job, like here's your action list when you leave the office. And, you know, in that moment, I had nothing. I realized, you know, but one, I didn't know where these diseases actually came from. I didn't know if they could be reversed. I now realize that these diseases were undermining everything that was valuable to her in her life. And I realized that medicine didn't prepare me to actually help put somebody's life back together again. Mm -hmm. So I walked out of that room kind of in a crisis moment, my career saying, you know, what am I going to do now? How can I help somebody put their life back together again? And it set me on a learning journey to try and answer those questions. And uh, through that journey, I realized, I thought, you know, some author that's written a diet book certainly has the answer. There's a lot of smart people. Is it the zone diet, the Atkins diet, the cabbage soup diet, the cookie diet? You know, who's right? And I read the books and I was more confused than when I started. <laughs> and they all had research. They all had stories, but none of them addressed like restoring quality of life. Yeah. 
Um, and so I just started reading research. I found Dr. Furman. I read Dr. Campbell's book right as it came out, 2000. Uh, you know, this was like 2003, 2004. And um, I started using my prescription pad to write breakfast, lunch, dinner. We changed our lives as a family and ah, everything changed. Incredible. Yeah. Everything transformed. Yeah. Did you, um, just curious, did you feel like a lot of times people, I know this happened for me and also Cersei, you got this kind of mental and spiritual clarity that came about as soon as you made the transition or did you kind of already have that? Um, no, it was a, it was an epiphany. Like I think Cersei was staring earlier before we started, you know, with the Daniel fast and the awareness that she gained that this should be a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I had kind of a similar epiphany in that moment that like this is a bigger solution than I could ever imagine. Yeah. It's not just about preventing, suspending, reversing disease. You know, it affects everything. The mm -hmm. food and the lifestyle choices that we choose every day and we make choices many times subconsciously, but we make the choices uh, have a profound effect on every relationship, on the way that we can share our gift with the world, on the farmers that are growing food, on the soil that the food's been grown in, on the mm -hmm. toxic chemicals that may or may not be in the soil and the water, on children, on the future of the world we're stewarding for generations, on the environment, on healthcare systems, on finance, on everything. And I had no awareness of that. You know, so many of my lifestyle choices were selfishly motivated or unconsciously driven because mm -hmm. it was the culture, because I grew up that way. Uh, it was convenience. It was so many other drivers. And it was this kind of unwinding of a way of life that I didn't realize I had been wound into by our culture. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I'm over here. I'm trying to like not jump up and like preach, you know, like raise my hands because I everything you're saying is so spot on because I, I think where I think where people a lot of times and, and I was in this place too, where you don't really think about how your health translates into all those other areas of your life until you have a health crisis or a health event and then you see it, you feel it, you see, you know, your loved ones just getting burned out, taking care of you. You see that, you know, you're, you're so busy going to office visits, you know, with the doctor to get some sort of treatment or get some more tests run. And, um, and then there's somehow, you know, not really making that connection that, you know, my choices in a lot of cases, and I know it's not all cases, but, you know, there are cases when my choices, you know, kind of created that problem that, and so it does permeate like all areas of your life. Um, and I'm so glad you brought that up because, um, you know, a lot of what we do is this, this concept about being healthy for your divine purpose, which you kind of mentioned, because that is, that is like a huge, you know, when you think about, you know, and I, I, I'll be quite honest with you. So when I adopted a whole food plant-based vegan diet, I did it initially. I went vegetarian for health reasons because I was sick and tired of just being fatigued all the time and having high cholesterol and the weight was starting to come on. But it wasn't, it wasn't until, so I went vegan for like animal reasons. That was my initial reason. But what came out of that was, was even bigger than that, right? It was like that mental spiritual clarity. And then I found a new purpose just after a lot of prayer, meditation, I found this new purpose that caused me to basically quit my 22 year career because I felt God moving in me in a different direction with my life. And then I moved into the health and wellness space. But, you know, none of that would have ever happened. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here talking today. I would have never met Cersei had I not made the decision to change what was on the end of my fork. That seemingly simple decision mm -hmm. just had so many, you know, implications, good, good implications. And it was like, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> you know, like, why did I do it sooner? So Cersei, I'm going to let you, I know you've yeah, got some questions. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, like everything you said are so powerful. And I think there's some nuances too, that you don't realize you know, like for me, like I told you, when I did the Daniel fast, I was in a trauma situation. I had just lost my son. There was a lot of going on, but I didn't realize that changing 
what you eat allows you to show up and cope with life's difficulties better. So here, you, so that's not something that you would even think of because you could be going to something, having going through life that has something to do nothing with food, but you don't realize that when your body is being nourished, you actually show up to life's challenges, a better version of yourself and you get through them even better. So if there were just so many different things, but Dr. So I'm going to dive into you because I'm dying to hear about this part, your book alive. Mm. When we found that book, we were like, oh my goodness, this is like the manual to our, <laughs> to our whole mission here, you know? So can you just talk to the audience about how you connect science and the Bible to helping your patients get healthy and even to um, providing information to doctors who, who want to understand this as well? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. You know, as I started to... Um you know, apply this in my practice and see how well my patients were doing. My thought was like, where, you know, this has to be like an original design because it works so well, you know? And so I started to go back and just do some research and, you know, um, I don't believe the Bible is prescriptive, prescriptive in its nature for a diet. And to do so would be kind of a misconstruing what the Bible is really about, which is the story of Jesus and reconciliation. Um, but if we go back and look at original design, but all the way back in Genesis, the original design was the garden. And if we look at life in the garden and understand this is God's best plan for man, then we can see what lifestyle should look like today. And, you know, in the garden, there was perfect relationship vertically with the father, perfect communion, communication on a daily basis, walking in perfect love. There was perfect relationship horizontally you know, first man and wife, and originally then designed to be a perfect community. There was perfect relationship in nature, you know, stewardship, tending, cultivating. Um, and in that communication with nature, it's rebuilding the microbiome, it's, you know, it's tending, caring for animals, it's everything. Um, the food was a plant-based, whole food, plant-based diet. They ate plants. Genesis 129, as you know, you know, God created plants to feed every living thing. So everything ate plants and was naturally restored. The soil was perfect. There was <clears throat> purpose and plans in man's heart to grow and expand the garden, <clears throat> magnify God's kingdom wherever, uh, all across the earth. And so <clears throat> that's that they were sleeping at night. There was no stress. There was no disruption. That's the perfect lifestyle. And so to me, as I in working on my own lifestyle and prescribing lifestyle, I'm always working back towards what is the original design? What's the blueprint? How do I replicate that today? What needs to get pushed out? What needs to get added in to come as close to that as possible? <clears throat> and you know, all the research that continues to roll out, whether it's in plant-based nutrition, in agriculture, in mindfulness, uh, in exercise activity, uh, in nature therapy, you know, forest bathing, all these other things that everywhere we look, there's health benefits, relational benefits that come from, you know, being in that original design. And so that was kind of the genesis of the idea for the book is to just build that out and try to understand uh, for all of us, like, how do I live that best, healthiest life that God originally designed for us? Yeah. And you mentioned something really powerful that stood out to me. You talked about the fact that you had a lot of pastors, missionaries, like people who were working in the church who were coming in very sick. And you realized that they weren't able to carry out the mission or the mandate that God had for them. Could you just talk a little bit about as Christians, as believers, as people of faith, how our mission can be undermined, God's plan can be undermined if we are not in a healthy body? Yeah, absolutely. And it's important for all of us to realize that, you know, as the word tells us, we are salt, we are light, we are ambassadors. And so everything that happens on earth needs to flow through us. It's Christ in us that's working in the world. And that's how God has ordered things. And he's given all of us very unique, special gifts to share that only you, Cersei, Gigi, myself, anybody else that is watching at this time in history can accomplish. You know, we've been given very special things that we're supposed to share and do in this world. And so the world system is always looking, you know, designed by the ruler of the world system to steal the gift, 
to quench the fire, to put out the light, to cover up the salt and inhibit us from being salt and light in this earth. And so there's a cultural current in this world that, that does, does, is designed to steal health and suppress gifts. And we see that especially in missionaries and pastors. And that's something that I noticed uh, as I was working with churches that, you know, and the research shows that pastors, ministers are more unhealthy than the American culture. They tend to be heavier, have higher cholesterol levels, levels and higher blood pressure numbers than the population in general. And when we look at all of the churches, all of the faiths that are in America, from Islam to Buddhism to Hinduism, um, evangelical Christians are the most unhealthy faith group in America today. Heavier, sicker, and it's no surprise. You know, it's a, it's a blind spot where the enemy has, I believe, come in and, and undermined health. Uh, and the pastors share with me that their own health limits their ability to go on missions trips, to have enough energy to serve. Uh, missionaries coming home from the missions field would come to see me because their missions were cut short from health issues that were preventable from lifestyle choices. And they did not know. And the prayer lists at churches are extraordinarily long because of uh, health related conditions that are preventable and reversible and pastors and teams go into hospitals and we should, but the time is being consumed because of these conditions that are preventable and i just always am thinking like what could we use that time for if the church was vibrantly alive we did not have lifestyle conditions and we had all the energy in the world what could we accomplish for the kingdom if the, we were not held back or hamstrung by these diseases that are really eroding the the um, intense and intentional purpose of the church today and I've worked with some pastors and, and churches that, um, that got it and made changes, tore up their lawns, put in gardens in, in place of that. I'm working with a um, group of Jamaican churches right now that are growing food and developing a health program and beginning to reach the community in that way. And in that way, you know, sharing the gospel in a very powerful way, it's love in action. I've also worked with churches where it was a, you know, four to six week Bible study they were very excited, but you know, they got overwhelmed in culture. They didn't grab a hold of it. And after the eight week Bible study, right back to the same struggles. So you're exactly right, Cersei. This is, um, it's a critical time for the church to, to wake up. And, you know, I, I think you all know this too. And I'd love to hear your insights that, you know, as people start making a lifestyle change, inevitably it brings up from the subconscious stuff that we have to deal with in our soul yes. you know food addictions emotional dependency on food poor sleep patterns poor management of stress not casting our cares and it just becomes you know either you have to deal with it or you push it back down and cover it up again with food so yeah. what's been your experience along that line as you've worked with people yeah you i'm glad you said that dr soul that's very powerful we talk a lot about food becoming a modern day item <clears throat> In this culture mm -hmm. and so like you said the more we come and get in in line with with using food for nutrition rather than like you said you know filling a need or of some sort is the closer i think we get to god because i think a lot of foods that we're eating it numbs that relationship because instead mm -hmm. of reaching to God for a pain that I have, I might reach for that chocolate cake. And mm -hmm. that's a missed opportunity of relationship mm -hmm. or an engagement of a relationship with God. And so here you have God, and I know it sounds crazy, but I think we do this subconsciously. He's competing for our, 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 our relationship in a way when we're, we're so consumed with, with the food and using food for all the wrong reasons. And so I think what you said is really true. Once we get to that point, it will not only will it bring up all these issues, but I think it will be an opportune opportunity for us to get closer to God because now we're not dependent on food anymore. It's not our idol anymore. So we will turn to God even more. And I think miraculous, that's where the miracle happens. And I think that's where we will see so many things get resolved and, and so many, we would advance more because now we're dealing with these issues with God and not with food. Mm. Yeah. And we, we kind of, so there, first of all, I want to say when you were talking, the other thing that, that kind of popped in my head, um, Dr. Stoll was 
What's really heartbreaking to me is when there's a funeral for a person who dies of high blood pressure, whatever the disease, you go into the basement after the funeral and you're eating the very foods that killed that individual. And that just completely breaks my heart. And um, I just wanted to mention that. And I, I and to answer your question about kind of how we deal with it, you know, our program, it starts with inviting God into your health journey. And then we have kind of a, a four-step approach that we use which is, you know, first is creating that God-centered self-image. I think a lot of times when um, we talk about losing weight, you know, we're thinking about fitting into that cute little black dress. It's kind of like for superficial reasons, right? Um, but we kind of reframe that and talk about, you know, creating a God-centered self-image. So that's the first step. The second is breaking our addiction to food, you know, um, really diving into the fact that our palates have been hijacked and that we're being played <laughs> and that, you know, we have to break our addiction to food. So there's, you know, targeted prayer around that. The third is breaking generational patterns of poor health. A lot of times we have this assumption that, oh, you know, my dad had high blood pressure, you know, my mom had it, so therefore I'm going to have it. It's just kind of like my lot in life. And so we, we break that, that myth, you know, it's, it's not, you know, a generational thing. It's more of the recipes and the habits that have been passed down. And then the fourth is that courage to take action, like to do something about it. You know, it kind of that Maya Angela, once you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we pray around that. And, and so I think, I think that, you know, going back to the whole thing around the churches, I love the fact that you called it a blind spot because I think that's what it is. It's a huge blind spot. And your, um, your book, I think, does an amazing job of just highlighting that connection around um, that your purpose. You know, you said that, um, I'm just going to read this real quick. I believe we should pursue optimal health because we are stewards of our bodies that they are temples and that it is our spiritual service of worship. And then you go on to talk about how the enemy is um, robbing us and destroying that tool. And, you know, I think that, that I, I, I feel like there's one, that awareness that I think churches can make and, and, and pa that pastors can make to their congregation. Obviously you have to convince the pastor, right? <laughs> That's um, right. And then, <laughs> and then and then, you know, and then having like a strategy for dealing with it, like, okay, we know this now, you know, what are the steps we need to go through as a congregation so that we can be, you know, stewards of that, you know, of our temple and be able to live out our divine purpose, go on those mission trips, do, you know, the work of God, of Christ, and, um, and make this world a better place. I mean... That's what I feel like it comes down to. But anyway, I'll stop babbling, Cersei. I'll let you go on. <laughs> no, no, it's like I can't stop good. talking about this. This is good. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I mean, we could go on and on about this, you know. So, Dr. So what, so what do you feel would be, because I know you said you've worked with some churches. I would love to hear more about the Jamaican church. My parents are actually from Jamaica, but I guess we could do that off air if you want. But, um, <laughs> You know, so so what do you feel is the is is the missing link for them to have that sustainability as a church? Because once you get that revelation on a spiritual level, you know how how do you encourage pastors to kind of keep that going? Yeah, can I share one? Uh, can I share a, a slide to talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. Right. We, I love slides. <laughs> yeah, it's a simple one. But I think it helps to answer that question, and it's uh, it's something that we often miss. So I'll just let me know when that screen sharing's on, and I'll pop it yeah, up real quick. Let's see. It's only one slide. I have thousands, so it's only one. Oh, no problem. Um, All right, let's see. But it's really a good question, Cersei, and it's so important because okay. you know it, this leads to um, sustainability of you know of an issue and. Uh, I'm just going to show this here. Let's see, where is that? Pulled from current. So this is kind of how I really begun to understand, you know, true transformation. And I got to turn off my closed caption there. Uh, true <laughs> transformation. 
Um, you know, so often in lifestyle medicine, even within the church and Bible studies, we live up here in the, the what and the how. You know, all the Bible studies are about doing. What do I need to do? How do I need to do it? And we become, you know, this systemized um, life where we're just, you know, creating our schedule. We're doing, we're reading the Bible in a year. We're, you know, doing the eight week Bible study. We're attending church every Sunday and Bible study on Wednesdays or in lifestyle. We're, you know, trying to add these things in. And this ultimately leads to frustration and challenges if we don't deal with the ultimate identity, as you just talked about, Cersei, and then the why are we doing it from our identity. And so I really have come to believe that with lifestyle, um, we have to dial all the way back and really do some deep soul searching to truly uh, clarify who we believe we truly are. And once we can get our identity squared away and we begin unwinding some of the lies that have been told to us, we begin forgiving uh, and releasing some of the things we let go of regret and resentment and our identity identity becomes more and more clarified about who Christ says we are and what the promises of the word tell us that we are and we begin to allow that to percolate down into our subconscious and root out some of the other issues there that identity becomes so solidified that it ultimately then drives our motivations why we're doing things and so that pushes out things like you mentioned earlier, the uh, idol of food um, or the idol of entertainment. They get pushed out because our identity says, no, I know who I am in Christ. I know and I have experienced God's love. And now I know my motivations, which are to go and demonstrate the same love that God has shown for me in this world. And that is, you know, in all of its manifestations, the fullness, fullness of its divine nature that we see in Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 13. And our whys become, our motivations become very purified. You know, our motivations aren't for selfish gain, aren't for fame, aren't for security out of fear. You know, our motivations become purified. Then we can add on top of that very easily the what and the how. This is what you need to eat. This is how it looks. This is what you need to do to exercise and take care of your body. And this is how you do it. Um, and it becomes this very enjoyable process of transformation. But if we don't take the time to kind of dial back and really um, do that deep soul work on our who, our identity, and cleaning up our soul, the motivations are disrupted and we, we ultimately run into these real friction points. And it can be very uncomfortable if we don't understand why we're encountering the friction. The friction can be greater than the, um, the benefits that we might understand intellectually for a lifestyle change. And we naturally fall back because the pressure is too great. Even though we may intellectually ascend that we know it's better, the, the identity and soul are always more powerful. And so for churches, I believe, to really be able to embrace long-term transformation and freedom, experience true freedom in lifestyle and diet, we need to go back and ask some very challenging questions uh, in our churches today that push us to clarify our identity, which will make our, our lights so bright that um, the world will see our good works and glorify God who's in heaven. So I'll stop there and stop my screen share, but. Yeah, and I, one of the things when you talk about identity um, that we, you know, really focus on as well is stopping. So when we have people come into our, our program and they say, I'm a diabetic, you know, one of the things that we try to, um, you know, kind of change that a little bit and say, no, you know, you have, type 2 diabetes, but you're not a diabetic because that, you know, I think subconsciously you hang on to that, you know? And so if it's like, no, I have diabetes, like, you know, I have a pencil and then I could like throw the pencil away mm -hmm. if I want to, sure, you sure. know, and then it's, then it's a little more easier to get your head around, like actually, you know, changing your lifestyle and changing your identity you know, associated with that. So, um, but, but, and I, and I, and I do think, I mean, I do think there's a little bit of, 
um, like for like for me at least, I didn't really know my identity until I changed mm. my lifestyle. It became my my divine purpose identity, meaning um, like I because I didn't have that clarity. I didn't have that spiritual clarity until I changed um, my lifestyle. And then it, and I think it's a little bit of a I think some people can go into it a little more consciously of having known that. And then I think for others like myself, I think I, for me, I, I felt like I knew there was something else that I was supposed to do with my life and who I was as a person, as a you know child of God. And, and I just didn't know exactly what that was until I realized that spiritual and mental clarity after changing my diet. So there's a little bit, I guess, of a leap of faith with that or you know maybe ignorance I don't know how to describe it but I, I I'm I'm so glad that you talked about identity because it is absolutely so powerful it creates this unconscious accountability um it's sometimes conscious but I think unconscious accountability for choices that you might make yeah yeah that's right and you know what's interesting too about like as you're mentioning lifestyle change helping us along that pathway that as you know when we make a lifestyle change it actually takes away some of the inflammation in our brain the neuroinflammation mm -hmm. and even after our health emergence people at the end of the week say you know i've not had this much mental clarity since i was 18. sometimes we remove those inflammatory foods and lifestyle choices and now all of a sudden we have the clarity and the energy to address some of the underlying issues that lead us down a pathway of transformation Mm -hmm. And so you're absolutely right that, you know, it's not always, we can't always just start with identity and work from that pathway. We have to just step out in obedience and do what's right. Yeah. And in the, that first step of obedience and doing what's right to take care of ourselves will lead down that pathway of restoration of all of those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I still say today that after I hear, I hear God's voice more clearly mm -hmm. when I'm in a healthy state. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that is so impactful because we want God's direction in our own personal lives. And we want to always hear his voice. We don't want anything to block it. And sometimes we don't realize that our lifestyle could actually numb our, our, our spiritual intuition, our spiritual ears or senses, because it's, it's like you said, bogged down with inflammation or tiredness or distraction, however you want to look at it. So yeah. it's like t tuning into an AM radio station and, you know, you're like, it's crackle, crackle. It's like, you can't quite get it <laughs> versus just like, you know, pulling up your um, song on, on iTunes or something and listening to it crystal clear in your headphones. So I know Cersei's kind of made a similar analogy, but yeah. Uh, and yeah, before you that, jump into your next question, I, I, I'm yeah. glad you clarify this, Dr. Stoll, because I know a lot of Christians, one of their objections will be, oh, you're glorifying food and nutrition and all these things. And the church is about Christ. This has nothing to do with that. And so they try to make this separation. But I'm glad you make that distinction that this is not about exalting food or lifestyle over the, the main mission of Christ, but what it is doing is aiding you to actually live out the Christ life. So they, they actually kind of go together. And so some people, their automatic response is, oh, it's all about the spirit and nothing about the physical. But we have to acknowledge that because God, our bodies are the temple, our spirit, our, our body is our vehicle to the soul. And if it is broken down along the way, you might, you, you could avoid getting to your destination. So it's not really glorifying. You don't really glorify the car in, in the mission that you're going, but you have to acknowledge that the car has to be in working condition to get you where you're going. Yeah, that's a great point, Cersei. You're absolutely right. It's actually putting things in the rightful place because, you know, today our culture and even within our culture of our churches, they worship food. You know, you go to the buffets and the banquets and the church pot lux and it's all about the food and you know people crave food they desire food they eat emotionally they eat from food addiction they eat because of anxiety they eat because they're bored i mean it's food it has a much more powerful place in our lives and in our church culture than it should and so we're actually taking it off the mantle and we're putting it back down where it belongs but in the process sometimes we have to pay attention while we're putting things back in in place and it, then, as you know, food just becomes an enjoyable process 
that that um, you know multiplies our health, gives us vibrant energy and mental clarity, so that we can go and do as you said, so that our car is in good working order that when God says, I want you to go, you can just jump in, turn the motor and off you go. Awesome. Okay, so I wanna switch gears um, and talk a little more about the state of lifestyle medicine. And um, the question I have is, and it, I, it doesn't have to be an exact percentage, but about how many physicians would you say are considered lifestyle medicine practitioners? Um, and actually, you know what, let's back up. Maybe you can maybe start off by defining what a lifestyle medicine practitioner is and then about like what percentage or fraction would you say are considered lifestyle medicine practitioners? Sure, so a lifestyle medicine clinician, healthcare provider is somebody that recognizes and understands the power of lifestyle in the process of d disease development to, or and or disease suspension and reversal. So they have studied the um, and understand the cornerstone of food as the foundation of health, the um, components of stress, of um, exercise, sleep, and community and love in that process. Uh, lifestyle med medicine physicians also recognize that substances, tobacco, alcohol, and uh, other issues um, are a component of a healthy lifestyle, removing those substances. So it's removing toxins. So they have had, they've gone through training process beyond their normal education, understand basics of science around those and use those as a primary pillar or foundation in their healthcare practices. Yeah, and in most cases, you know, the diseases that predominate in healthcare today are manageable, reversible and preventable through the application of lifestyle. It should have been a foundation of medical education from the very beginning. And today we find ourselves with, you know, in the United States, we don't know for sure, but based upon estimates from, you know, organizations, we're probably in the 10 to 15,000 range for healthcare physicians, providers. Um, globally, maybe 25, 30,000. We don't, you know, it's, so when you look at the, the numbers for the number of healthcare providers in the millions around the world, we're a very, very small percentage. But the good news is that, you know, there are medical schools now that are beginning to utilize lifestyle medicine curriculums. There are residencies that are integrating lifestyle medicine into their training programs. Organizations like uh, the Plantrition Project, American College of Lifestyle Medicine are growing exponentially. Conferences are springing up all over the world. So we're in the, the very early days of a um, revival of lifestyle medicine in healthcare globally. Yeah, so that brings us to, could you tell us a little bit about the Plantrition Program? Just tell us all about sure. it. Sure, so, you know, when I made that um, big transition in my own practice, um, I was uh, thinking about this and how long it took me as a healthcare provider to make my, you know, my own transition and to learn the information and trial and error in my practice, development of tools for my patients. And uh, I had said to my friend, Tom Dunham, who also works with me on the immersions, said, you know, we need to start a conference for healthcare providers. So we did that back, we started in 2012, we had our first conference in 2013. And we were joined by another partner, Susan Benegas, who's now the, Amer the executive director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So we had a very successful first conference. Uh, we had 180 people from 12 countries that came to our conference. And we wrapped it all in a not-for-profit called the Plantrition Project, whose mission is to equip, empower, inspire, and educate healthcare providers with the indisputable science of whole food plant-based nutrition to prevent, suspend, and reverse disease. And so we have grown a not-for-profit that has now conferences in multiple places, uh, non-COVID years in New York, California. We helped our friends down in Melbourne, Aust Australia, start a not-for-profit and a conference. I work with Prince Khalid. We started one and uh, just had our second conference in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, we've done virtual conferences on the way to a live conference that was supposed to happen in 2020 in Bangkok, Thailand. And, um, you know, the Plantrition Project has also developed a number of resources for healthcare providers, um, including a journal, a free journal called the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. Dr. Kim Williams is our editor-in-chief, and anybody can sign up for that journal and follow the science. It's ijdrp.org. 
And then our most exciting project, our legacy project we're launching this summer, it's called Plantrition U. And so we are um, kind of curating all of the lectures that have been a part of our conferences from amazing people, Dr. Kim Williams, Columbus Batiste, um, uh, Dean Ornish, Michael Greger, all these amazing lectures over 10 years, all of the written material that we've produced, we're putting it on our learning management system and we're going to make it available for free to every healthcare professional student in the world. So at any point in college or graduate school that they find this information, they can begin their learning journey and integrate um, plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine into their education. And so they'll grow up knowing and understanding this rather than finishing and having to come to our conference <laughs> to begin unlearning and relearning. <laughs> And, uh, you know, just one thing uh, interest before I finish, there's an interesting study that was done on medical school students and they interviewed medical school students before they started medical school. And nearly 80 percent of them believed that nutrition was critically important for health. By the end of year two, guess what the number was? Zero. Wow. <laughs> we trained it out of them. We trained all interest and recognition that nutrition is important out of them in the first two years of medical school. So we want to intersect that and we want to, you know, bring the powerful science of plant based nutrition to these students early in their careers. We want to create a mentoring platform to come along and mentor the future leaders and help them grow up into the generation that actually ushers in lifestyle medicine. That is remarkable. I love all the work you've done and the work that you continue to do. Um, it, it's 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 the kind of work that's going to reap benefits like years beyond, you know, our lives, you know, it's going to just like, it's just going to transcend into generations to come. And um, for, so for people who are listening and they're not like a healthcare provider, but they're just like a, you know, a person who maybe is struggling with something and would like to find a lifestyle medicine practitioner. I know there aren't that many but are there some resources or places where people can go to kind of look up where they can find a local health uh, lifestyle medicine practitioner? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gigi. We started a resource called plantbaseddocs.com. And so it's a growing kind of geo directory of providers who understand the power of lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition. Uh, and so you can log on there, put in your zip code and by, whether by telehealth or by um, location near your home, you can find a healthcare provider that will understand the power of nutrition and work with you to bring you to a healthier uh, place. And you know, thanks to telehealth, that's one of the good things that came out of COVID. Yeah. You can find a, a practitioner online that can work with you and, yeah. uh, and really help make a difference. And so you know, that's a big deal. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've come across through the years that you know, went to their doctors, asked them about nutrition, the doctor didn't know anything and so they didn't make any changes. Or worse yet, the doctor gives them the wrong advice mm -hmm. and they end up with a major health problem because of the nutritional advice that they receive for them from their healthcare provider. So that's plantbaseddocs.com. It's a great resource. ACLM also has a member database um, that can be a valuable tool as well. Okay, well, I appreciate that so much and so true about um, doctors either not knowing or giving the wrong advice and a lot of people rely on their doctors to give them advice about nutrition so um, it's just a misconception people don't understand the, the the education and training in medical school doesn't you know hasn't allowed for nutrition education but that's changing and I'm glad to hear it. Thirsty did you have any other questions for Dr. Stoll? No, I, I think that is it. I mean, um, Dr. Sol, you are doing some amazing work and it was a pleasure and honor to have uh, interviewed you and even just to meet you for the first time. You are a rock star in this area. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for you all. I'd like to know your vision for your program. Like, where do you see it in two years, five years? What do you hope comes out of this, this great program that you've created? Well, we know that there's like 3.2 billion Christians in the world. So we're just like, if we could just get 1%, we'd be happy. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, Cersei, you go ahead. Yeah I, yeah, I think our vision, just what Gigi says, but I think honestly, our vision in, in the next two years is to 
um, changed a paradigm in the Christian community um, that people will begin to, like you talked about, Dr. Stoll, tap into that why. And this is why we have this whole concept of healthy for my purpose. Mm. So people will now get a stronger, more sustainable why um, and become more healthier because it, in the end, we feel like that's advancing the kingdom by advancing mm -hmm. people's health. And so so yeah, so our, our biggest goal is to just to change that mindset. So Christians, women, and men across the world will start saying, you know what, I'm going to be healthy for my purpose now. Mm. So that that's our that's our ultimate mission. I love that. That's awesome. I love that you've linked those two. I have not seen that before. Mm -hmm. um, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. Our program's pretty unique. It, it has like a really good balance of both um, kind of spiritual a spiritual component. And then also plant-based nutrition education. So when people come through our program, they get a balance of both. But it all starts with inviting God into your health journey, and um, and that you know that in and of itself makes like all the difference, you know. And so um, we're just we're really excited. We've had some really good successes with um, some people that have gone through people's A1C, getting back to normal, losing weight lowering cholesterol is pretty common. So um, it's been super exciting to see the transformation that started with a program that started in the middle of COVID. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> Dr. Still. Cersei and I were, we're like 3000 miles apart and we met over Zoom. And like you said, this was one of the benefits of COVID. We all kind of became Zoom competent and it yes. became a vehicle to communicate and connect. And um, and so we were on each other's podcast slash YouTube channels. And because we had this shared passion, we were like, when we started hearing the numbers about um, people with comorbidities mm -hmm. being most impacted by COVID and it directly influencing or impacting the Black community, we were just like, wait a minute, we know the answer. Get rid of the comorbidities. Yeah. And so we got together and just started, you know, collaborating and brainstorming and then ultimately we um, we created this program, like we launched our, I think our Facebook group in July of 2020. Mm -hmm. So it'll be two years coming up. Yeah. And then it just, we just started creating content. And then we had these four day challenges to kind of nudge people in the direction. And they were like, okay, well, these four days were great. What do I do next? And so then mm -hmm. we created this four week program. And so, um, yeah, so it's been impacting a lot of lives in a good way. And uh, we're also, you know, kind of in, in the throes of trying to connect with some churches to kind of work with them as well, um, more on a, a group basis. But um, we're, we just, you know, it's kind of like we, when we first started doing this, um, we had no idea like how it would unfold. We just knew we were kind of, God was driving us to do this. It was like totally divine mm -hmm. intervention. And and Cersei, I hope, I hope you don't mind me sharing. Yeah, no, this go with ahead. You, go ahead. So this is this is Dr. Stoll, this is how divine this is. <laughs> Cersei lost her son after <laughs> yeah. So Cersei lost her son. So this was in 2011. Mm -hmm. And it stemmed from complications from hypertension. She mm -hmm. had hypertension, and so during delivery, her, her son lost oxygen to the brain. He, um, he was born but was on required 24-hour care, and shortly after his first birthday, he passed away. And um, he died on my birthday. Wow. Mm. June wow. 18th, which will be this Saturday, two days from now, from the day that we're recording this. Yeah. yeah. And it was out of that experience that I felt God was telling me to do a purpose with the Daniel had. Out of that experience. Mm. So when he when I saw when I sent her the video about it, she said, My birthday is January 18th. June 18th. And that yeah. was God saying, This is what I called you to. Yeah. 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 This is beauty from ashes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This is beauty from ashes. Yeah. And, and we met for the first time. So we started this program in 2020. We didn't yeah. actually meet up in person until a year later. It was July, 2021. Yeah. I flew to Atlanta. She drove to Atlanta. We yeah. met up at an Airbnb. And that was the first time we actually like met face to face. After one and year. So <laughs> after, after one year. Yeah. yeah. So. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a beauty from Ash's story. This yeah. is a life and life abundantly. Mm. This is beautiful. 
Yeah, I just speak a blessing over all that you do, that it would multiply in its reach and its impact and its effect, and that um, you would reach more than 1% of the, that 3.2 billion. I, yeah, I am I, believing yeah. that everything that's in the way has to get out of the way and that there's a pathway being laid for you to roll right into people's homes, TV screens, and phones. And I, I speak that blessing over all that you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Stoll. We appreciate you. Oh, 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 oh,